All right, hey, welcome back to the Community Podcast. I'm Chase Johnson Lynch, and you know, this is when I usually talk to someone from the community of interest that I'm like, hey, there's a story and everyone, and it's now time to open the page of a book on my man right here, my man Richard Johnson, you know, who's joining the Condor Online family. You know, uh, some of you might have seen him on, on a previous show because uh, he started a new show called The Philosophy of Winning and everything. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But first, welcome, Richard. Welcome. Yeah. So, as you know, Richard's kind of quiet and he said, you know, maybe, you know, if we kind of like get to know me a little bit more, <laughs> people can like understand me more yeah. because uh, I'm kind of quiet. <laughs> He's a writer, you see, you know, and he spends a lot of time listening to people's stories, um, their success stories, and um, the book that you're compiling, I understand, is going to be talking about the pillars of success, and you told me that there were like four pillars. Let me tell me a little bit about, break those four pillars down for us. But it's, it's basically, what, 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 what the book is, is basically saying is that you've got to have a right foundation, because if, if you haven't got a good foundation in life, then you stand the chance of being knocked down. Mm -hmm. So, in all, the foundation is more important than the actual building on top of something which you can build a great castle, but if it's got no a weak foundation, then down comes the castle. So it's, it's basically on that foundation. Yeah, because you kind of shared this story about what actually happened in America and Galveston and something like that. Oh, in, in, yeah, cause in Galveston, there was an, um, in the 1900s, there was, there was a major storm, like a hurricane, and it smashed through the town, broke houses to pieces, Mm. Killed about 12,000 12, people died, Many 80,000 people were made homeless mm. and um, they didn't really learn from the mistakes, like history always repeats itself. What happened is um, after, I think it was in 2007, another storm came and the same thing happened again. People had just built the houses back up to what they were originally, or probably better houses, but the foundations weren't dealt with. And this storm came. Um, smashed through the community, ripped houses up, um, there was many casualties, people homeless again, same situation but obviously less deaths. Mm. But the main thing is, what stood, stood out in this story to me, is there was one house standing on its own, a big yellow house in the middle of devastation. And this house, because the, when the flood came, they brought the sea in, Most Galveston's a coastal, coastal town, they brought the sea in, and the sea rose 15 feet mm. up, which went over most houses. Kind of like Noah's Ark. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, what, what, you, what, what this house was built on was four big pillars, mm. which were raised up 14 feet off the floor. So it was only one foot of water that was attacking this house, which is not too bad of an issue. Although the wind damage went through the house, took the windows out yeah. and all this, so there was some external damage, but the structure and the house itself stood. And it became an, um, a pillar of, basically people in that community were saying, who built this house? Mm. That, was, that was the question, who built yeah. this house? Yeah. So, I mean, so that leads to, uh, I guess, like, like you said, like these four pillars of success, where you said like the first one was like loving what you do. Yeah. Yeah, well, what were the other two, uh, the other three actually? But integrity, loyalty, and resilience. So, so these are kind of like like chapter headings, in, in the book that you're working upon about yeah. the philosophy yeah. of winning, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And mainly, as uh, you said, it also brings it back down to, you know, like turning um, pain into purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And stuff, you know, because you kind of like quoted Nelson Mandela and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And I thought that was really interesting. And um, because, I mean, I talked to you, you know, previously, of course, about the book. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there was one journey in particular that I was fascinated with was um, Alan Kennedy's journey, mm -hmm. you know, because you shared uh, the story uh, about this photograph. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I just thought that might be an interesting mm -hmm. <coughs> thing to share because, again, it seems that pictures have a lot of significance to you and mm -hmm. your own story. So, can you tell us about the the Kennedy photograph? Well, Alan Alan Kennedy's um, he's, he's he's well known Liverpool ex Liverpool player. He, he won the European Cup with Liverpool twice. In fact, in both of those those games, he he scored the winning goals. Mm -hmm. um, but his story, which which went back when he was a, when he was a child, when he was about eight years old, he had um, a Pacific. 
that basically in, in school, he played for the school team, he was the worst player on the team. And um, he was a skinny little insignificant kid. We don't know about that kid. And, um, but he was in the team. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what happens is um, the school teacher put, took a school photograph and uh, most, most of the kids in the, in the class were kind of made up to be on the school photograph. He looked at it and they went celebrating saying, you know, I'm, I'm in the school team and they were boasting, yeah, look at me on the picture board and blah, 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 outside the, yeah. the headmaster's office, you know, that kind of thing. But Alan looked at it differently. He looked at that picture. How can I change that boy in that picture to become something that he isn't today? Mm. How can I make that boy the best player in the team, in that team? How can I become just like them other boys? That became his goal, to be like them other boys in that picture. And that gave him a drive to become better. Mm -hmm. And so all that he went through, he, his resilience went stronger and stronger and stronger the more he went on. And when he's um, in 90, I think in 1981, he, he was like, they took a picture in the Liverpool football team, the European Cup, and they got, I think they won, I'm not sure if they won the travel, I think they won the travel. So they've got all the trophies there. He's no longer the little boy on the left-hand side of the photograph. He's, he's, he's a fully grown man, a centre player in the team, sitting in the middle next to the manager. Mm -hmm. See? So uh, that, that, that story kind of inspired me to, you know, to push on. Yeah, I mean, well, obviously, because in, in, in talking with you about um, your story um, and everything, I can see how it, it does have significance for you. So let's go a little bit back into the origin story, you know, like who is Richard Johnson, you know, and uh, you were telling me about like your early days of uh, being fostered and everything. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit about yeah. that? Well, well I, was, I was fostered until, until, up until the age of six. Like, my mum was a, was a midwife. And she, it, this is back in the day when, you know, like she, she was from Anfield, but she had, she couldn't like, she really, it wasn't, uh, with a colour, the colour kind of thing, her parents weren't, weren't racist, but she didn't really want to say that she'd had a child out, out of wedlock, mm. that kind of thing. She, so she, she had me, and then she, but she had to keep her career going because she wanted to please her dad, you see, and all this kind of thing. So she um, fostered me when I was six weeks old. But she went and got off a, a flat around the corner from me, foster parents. I went to a good home. I mean, they had, they had plenty of money and stuff like that. But um, they, 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 all, they used to foster other children. Mm. And in, in that home, there was, an, um, there was a, guy, a guy called Strife. And he, he was from um, Zimbabwe. And what happened with Strife was um, his mum and dad were killed in, in a, some civil uprising. And um, he was taken by this, this charity. And he ended up... In, in Birkenhead, in, in this home, in this foster parents' home. So I met him when I was quite young, as a young child, that's mm -hmm. when he first came. And then I, I, my mum went, went back, sorry, my mum my got me back, and I went back to live with my mum again, and she got married. So um, although I kept in touch with the, with the foster parents, I used to go and see them very regularly. Um, when I was 16, I went back to the, mm -hmm. foster, the foster parents, Wow. And it was that point when I was there, I was into partying. I just wanted to live life to the full. So I was like, Ooh, yeah. yeah, so I was out all, I'd be out Thursday, Friday. But everything in my life was about clothes, looking good, going out, and that was it. But then Strife, who was also living there, mm -hmm. was, I'd pass him on the stairway, he was quite a big house, and he'd, he'd always have a big pile of books under his arms, mm -hmm. and he'd say, hello Richard, how's you doing, blah, 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 see you later, blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking, why is he like, why is he not partying? What? He's so boring, he's always in a book. What's the matter with this guy? So, but then, Strife, long story, I won't go into the whole story, yeah. but, but what happened to Strife? He went back to, um, South, went back to Zimbabwe, and he was picked up by the rebel forces there, and they tried to make him fight against this Robert Mugabe. But um, they realised he was educated, so they said, we'll pay for you, you know, your, your schooling, mm -hmm. we'll send you to a university. So um, he said, no, I'll go back to my foster parents and I'll do my own path and she'll find me a university. So he went back to, back to Birkenhead. I think he went to um, was either Wales or Scotland. He went to a university there. She found him, my foster mum. She had lots of contacts. Found him at a university. So he goes through his schooling. This would have been that time when I, I'd met him mm -hmm. for the second time. So he then, he, um, he went back to, South, uh, back to Zimbabwe. Um, and 
with a goal of setting up his own telecommunication company. But he started working in the company, learned the inside of the business, um, he knew exactly where he was going. And then eventually he started his own company, and which took over the whole of the um, internet. Sorry, not the internet, the um, telecommunications across Zimbabwe became the biggest company in, in, in that country. And um, he was very successful, so he was a multi-millionaire. He, um, and he said he had a dream to give every African a yeah, mobile phone. Yeah, yeah, his, his dream was to give every African a mobile phone. So he... Um, Some kid from Brokenhead. So he, he, gets, um, he gets all this success, but then Robert Mugabe put him under house arrest because he's, what he's done now is give... He's given the Africans um, communication. Robert, Robert Mugabe is a dictator mm -hmm. and he wants to close people down. He doesn't want people communicating. So he's under house arrest for three years. He, by this time he's got a family. Yeah. And also, I, I will say, he, he picked up a, a young boy, right? This is when he was a, when he was a kid, he was a, an orphan, and brought him into his household and brought him up as his own son. Mm -hmm. And that kid's obviously... Well, obviously well. coming from being forced to yeah, so, so we get you know back. I mean, yeah, yeah, back yeah, yeah. I mean, but so, so I mean, yeah. It it sounds it sounds crazy. It's uh, uh, it's like the prince and a pauper or something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like two brothers, two different worlds, and everything mm -hmm. like that. You know, and I had asked you. I mean, what what was your learning on all of this? Because you said it woke you up a little bit. Yeah. So in in, in that story. Um, he, 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 I'll just go on a little bit further. When he went to, um, he fled, he, he went to South Africa. And when he was in South Africa, he found um, he'd lost a lot of his business. And what he, just, he needed to get on this, this a contract to get on. It was a big contract. So he had to get 50 million pounds together, to, which he didn't have. And basically what they did in the business, one of his business partners wrote a blank check out, which they didn't have the money in the bank, handed it into this guy. It was because um, basically it was all big companies were all coming together like um, like um, BT, all these big big multi players, Excellent. and it was a it was a fighting for a contract, but to, to even walk in the room you need fifty million deposit, and then wow. from from that you need one hundred and twenty five million to actually take you further. So they needed that fifty million. They were so trying to get serious gambling yeah, going. Yeah, they were yeah. trying to get bank money to, to to fund this. Yeah, but they were having problems, so. His, his partner wrote out a cheque for 50 million, handed it to the guy, and luckily the guy went on a holiday. Mm. And when the guy was on a holiday, they went to, went to this, they had to fly somewhere, they flew to this, wherever the, the meeting was, they won the contract, and now he's, he's worth 4 billion. So, but this yeah, story, yeah, yeah, his, his story yeah, is very really successful. Um, but what, what that taught me was, um, when I look back on, on my life, I looked at and th thought, you know, he's got that. And also, I'll say, my, my father also, which I never met, was, um, was, a, was a rich man. He had his own um, pharmaceutical company and business in Russia and stuff like that. So, but I'd never met him. So, it, it was like, um, I, t I constantly say, well, why am I in this position? Yeah. And these guys are in this position. What separated me from them? And like, then obviously, like, you know, I, I, I've gone down a different road. I've chosen a different path from them. Yeah. Yeah, well, like, speaking of that, because, you know, moving to, you know, what brought you uh, to the life coaching, like, where you were looking for these answers, mm -hmm. like, why am I in this position? Yeah. Like, so, you were saying, like, at that time, the position, you were you were a PT, weren't you, yeah, at the time, yeah. and things weren't going well, mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I, was, I, was doing, I was doing personal training, and I built up a client base when I first got into the business, and then what happens is, like, in, 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 it's almost like with PT, it's, all, it's always, almost like you've got to fill the cup up and keep on filling it. So you need a good marketing plan to keep the cup filling because people always leave and mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the nature of the business. But um, I was not, not completely aware of that and it caught me, just like, you know, the foundation was not right. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, I had no clients. Yeah. I'm paying rents, I've got to pay an expensive gym membership of £100 or whatever, it's just to be in the gym. Yeah. And um, a week. So. It was kind of, um, I was struggling, but I went on this life co coaching course, which was booked anyway, so it was part of the thing, but when I went on the course, everybody was jumping in the air saying, Whoa, we celebrate, we love life, life's brilliant. And it wasn't brilliant for me, and I thought, this is not, not, not true. Just, you, it's not you, my, my experience. <laughs> this is not my experience. 
and um, so I, I really struggled on the course. But I looked on the on the wall, and there was a big poster mm -hmm. as big as this. And it had um, a picture of a guy mountain climbing, climbing yeah. up a rock face yeah, on rope with rope, and then just you couldn't see the, you couldn't see the, the peak. The peak was here, but it was just around the corner. Mm -hmm. And like he's underneath the rock, so he can't see. It. And it said, just when you think of giving up. Mm. Success is just around the corner, or the peak is just around the corner. And that, when I looked at that, that's the only thing I got from that course was don't give up. Yeah. Don't give up. So I didn't give up. I went back to the gym and blah blah blah, do do do, and built the clients up again. And but but then obviously it goes down. But what I've learned from personal training from that is the networking. It's put mm. me in in different circles of networking because I've met all different types of people. So that, that's a real good positive to come out of it. Um. So, I mean, so you said this is what you learned about not giving up. So, I mean, can you share what that learning is? Like, because the question would be, yeah. like, why should people, you know, not give up? Yeah. Well, I, I, I've, 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 I've found, like, I've, set, I've set, started businesses, I've done restaurants, like gym business together, and, mm -hmm. and I've found failure constantly in, in, in various business and I think it's probably down to planning um, maybe some bad luck as well but what one, one thing that like um, I, I, I was talking briefly about I was talking about Matt Busby before well I won't go into the whole story but Matt, Matt Busby famous uh, Manchester United manager a uh, great player Munich 58 he was the manager who brought a great youth team into, into football but when he, when he was at Man City he was um, at first when he got into the, the team, he was playing okay, but then he went into a, a dry patch and started struggling. Mm. And he, what the thing about him, he, um, he was going to give up. He was going to pack the whole thing up because he he was getting he just couldn't play anymore. He was all over the place. But then what kept him going was the fact the manager moved him into a different position. And when he was in that different position, everything clicked. And I think mm. sometimes in life, you've got to find. You, your, your, position your own position in life of who you are, what 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 motivates you. You can like if I'm in the wrong position, if I'm a builder over here working as a builder, I'm in the wrong wrong position because this is where I should be here. Yeah, you see. So, but I might fear being here because I might think I'm not qualified to be here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But as a builder, it's easy for me just to keep doing what I'm doing. No, I I, I totally so, I totally get you. It's kind of like a baseball field. With, and, am I supposed to be in left field mm -hmm. or shortstop or? third base, you know, yeah. so it's kind of like, you know, positioning I think is very important because I think a lot of people don't know where they belong. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people kind of like are told that they should be a, uh, a doctor or a mm -hmm. lawyer. Those By the parents or what? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. You know, or just go and be a joiner, mate. You're not mm -hmm. going to be no lawyer. <laughs> you know, just, you know, and they're lost, you know, mm -hmm. and we have a, I think we have a society full of lost people mm -hmm. who are just like wandering about. But it, 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 it's that thing of just taking the risk to just go into something, mm. anything, to figure out where that position yeah, is that yeah. you're talking but about. But once, once you find, once you find um, your position in life and what, what really wakes you up every morning, mm. and what motivates you and what's, what eats you up, once you find that, I think it's um, staying in it and going through the fear zone. There's a story, um, I kind of, it's a true story, it's, um, there was a guy called Charles Blondin. Mm. Back in the um, the late eighteen hundreds, and um, he he was the first person to cross from the Niagara Falls on a on a on a on a, on a tight mm. So what what Charles Blondin did, he um, obviously he's walked across like the Gulf of the the raging waters underneath. But when he, when he, the first time he walked across, he walked across holding the pole, mm. um, and successfully made the journey. Then he went back without the pole. Um, he, when, he, when he used to go out, he'd have 40,000 people out to watch him, it was, it was a big occasion. So um, he walked across with a wheelbarrow and they, what they did is took the, the actual rubber parts off, so the, just the, the metal part mm. fits on the rope, but still, he pushed the wheelbarrow across. Then he went across with his manager, pushing his, ma his manager, sitting in the wheelbarrow, pushed him across. And then he went across um, once and stopped and with a special type of stool, put the stool down and sat and cooked a bit of food. No so, way. No, he, honestly, this is true, true story. He, he, he became so good at his craft, right, that it was just normal to him. Now, 
what, what, what's um, the thing about um, Charles Blondin? What, what struck me was um, fear for me to get from here to there right, is is a fearful thing because you always look at the what's the outer circumstances. What if I fall? What if this happens? What if you know it doesn't work out? But there was one particular time when uh, Charles Blondin was crossing. He, he went across with the wheelbarrow, empty. And he gets to the other side and he says, um, he, he pinpoints the crowd, looks into the crowd and he says, he sees a big guy and he says, Sir, do you believe that I can cross again with this barrow with a man in it? And the crowd went, ah, we all believe you, thousands of them cheer. And, and so he picked one man out of the crowd and said, Sir, do you believe? And he said, yes, I do. And he said, jump in. Now that, that, that man, that man went silent. Yeah, of course he did. <laughs> and, <laughs> no way, huh? And the thing is, he didn't really believe. If he really believed, he'd jump in. And sometimes, one, when we say, yeah, 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 I believe, I want to get it, I want to do this, I want to do that, blah, blah, blah. But then, we're not willing to jump in. And when we, when we really do jump in, that's when things can change. It's fearful crossing, mm -hmm. but it's, if you stay where you are, you're gonna have a miserable existence. You know, I mean, you know, you you also made a point, uh, you know, because failure leads to success if you're in the right place. Mm -hmm. where, where did that come from? Being in the right place is when we went back to that story before, we were talking about the positioning. Like, when you find what you really, what really eats you up inside, like, like I'm a personal trainer, I, I love doing what I do, but it's not, what really eats me up inside. Now, the best thing I've found from... Now nah, get your juices flowing. <laughs> the best thing I've found from, from being a personal trainer is communicating with people. Mm -hmm. Like, like I mean, you meet all different types of people and you, you share their s stories and you learn more about them. And, and that's what I like more than the actual training the people. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But I, but I train people and I do a good job in what I do. But it's, it's only been a stepping stone to cross over into what really is for me. You know, I mean, I mean, stepping stones is a very interesting like terminology there because it's like it does take a few steps, but like basically, if you have like step stones like over water, you know, and it's kind of like you know, it's kind of like when Jesus walked across the water. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's like you know, um, do you need trust in all of this? Yeah, you could. You need because you need, it's kind of like you, need, you know, you need I can't see the stones. Yeah. I know the stones are there, yeah. but I'm gonna walk I th anyway. I, th I think you need some kind of confidence. You need to. You need to really believe in what you do, and it, and it's 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 not just like, you know, for me to suddenly take a big leap of faith and start crossing over that Charles Blondin mm -hmm. tightrope. It's more about. It might just be that first little step, and like example, I, when when I met you, I, I came in here for to do podcasts. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know I was going to be sitting here like this now. Are you doing a What I'm saying is to learn the course. <laughs> yeah. I didn't expect to be sitting here now and doing talk, talking to you. Yeah. So that's taken a step because I'm, I find it uncomfortable to do this. This is like I've got a fear of like public speaking. Mm. So, so I have a fear of public speaking and suddenly I'm in front of this. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a leap of faith, isn't it? It is because yeah. you're in front of uh, uh, a lot of people when mm. you go with that. And everything like that, you know. But um, I like the terminology that you said uh, about inner drive and going through storms. Um, you remember what that was? Go, go well, well, everything. In, like, I'll, I'll give you some examples of. of, of uh, I read a Tony Robbins book many years ago, right? From mm -hmm. a, this is this is just after I'd um, gone on that not course when I did the um, what's the name course, the life coaching course. So I came out of a life coaching course, went to a uh, celebration dinner when I was giving me certificates. Mm. And now I'm a life coach, going back in time of course. So I thought to myself, I can't teach anyone how to be a better person when I'm like this. I feel ins insignificant, blah, blah, blah. So I, I refused to go and go out to the market and advertise, get cards printed and say I'm a life coach. Mm -hmm. Because what, 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 I was thinking, what could I offer anybody? Because I need coaching myself, mm -hmm. so I didn't do it. But what I did, and I said to myself, I'm gonna, I'm gonna know more about this. And I went and bought literally hundreds of books, not all in one sack. Every week I was reading two books a week on 
um, self-help. I went through all the, the Tony Robbins and all these different other books. And um, one book, it was a Stephen Covey book, um, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, that book. Done some major changes in me. Because it, it was like more inner rather than outer. Yeah. I, I won't go into all that now, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, was a, that was a real game changer. But one book of, which was Tony, I, I listened to all the Tony Robbins um, talks, blah, 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 I even went to see him. But there was one point, um, I read this, one of his books, and in the, in the book it was saying, because before that I read that book, what happened is um, I was thinking I'm addicted to these books. <laughs> and well, I, 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 I'm like a, a book junkie. I yeah. just read books and go, yeah, yeah, this is great. And then I'll throw that book down, go and buy another one. And it was like I was hungry for more information. Yeah. But I wasn't crossing that line. I was, there was no, for me going from there to there, it was all about just reading the more and more books. And I said, this can't go on. Because I'm getting nowhere. I'm just becoming an addict to these yeah. books. So in one particular book, in, in the Tony Robbins book, it said, it was like a 30 day challenge, right? Of not to, uh, to, it was basically a mindfulness, not to, it was basically saying that you can, you can allow the thought, but don't bite it. Just mm -hmm. let it be. So if a thought comes into your head, the negative thought, just let it be, but don't bite it for 30 days. So I said to myself, I'll, I'll do this, and I started it. Now, when I was doing that, a few things happened. Like one, um, and, and some things happened after it, but the one, one thing that did happen, uh, I had um, some, some money and some personal training money, I had about 16 quid in my pocket. And I took the dog around the park, and I used to have two buskies. So I'd have a special lead, and I'd be on a bike, and we'd just spin around the park. And um, anyway, I got a text message, so I pulled the phone out of the pocket, and the money went into the wind. But I didn't know this. So I, I went to an. Um, I went to a boxing gym because I was, I was going to train myself and I get to the boxing gym, there's no changing rooms there, so, well there is a changing room but there's no um, lockers so I've had to put the money somewhere safe on me because I can't leave it hanging up in the, in, yeah, in yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the changing room. So um, I kind of like went to get the money, it wasn't there and I shot back to the park, went round the park, got nothing there and I said to myself the money has gone, I'll never see that money again, gone, finished. But then, when I got close to my house, there was a, I found in the street, because it had blown, there was a bun, two little bundles, uh, probably about 250 quid of the money was returned, because it was like, must have gone everywhere. So I got 250 quid back, and I said to myself, this is the best day ever, because I just found 250 pounds a day, and I went home in a great mood. And that's, sometimes you've got to learn to take a negative and switch it into a positive, and that's that's what that book taught me. And I practiced, I was practicing it. Yeah. And I, there was, there was There's a, always another way of seeing. Yeah, yeah. Like another time, I was in London. Um, I was like, I was on Oxford Street. Beautiful day, walking along the streets, and I had a fixed ticket to get back to Liverpool. And I had to get back at meetings and stuff the next day. And um, anyway, what happened is I went to get some sweets and lost some time. And then I ended up getting this bus, which was a mistake. To Houston from Oxford Street, and it just got stuck in traffic. And it was horrendous. And I started looking at me, watching, going, oh, What am I going to do? Oh, my my mind was saying, Whoa, you're going to you're gonna, what, you're gonna have to pay another 200 pounds for the ticket, and you're going to miss it, and this is happening, and you're going to. It was screaming all kinds of problems. And I was basically in, in a, I was going into a state of turmoil. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And I felt like, as people were getting on the bus slow, like old people, I felt like grabbing them and throwing them in the seats. Yeah. You know, and telling the drivers to, to drive through the traffic. But then suddenly I said to myself, what's the worst that can happen in this? Mm, what? And, okay, I might have to buy another ticket. I might have to do this, I might have to do that. And I suddenly I was looked out the window and it was a beautiful day. Mm. I noticed it was a beautiful day. And there was no problem. I got to Houston, missed the train. I went into the um, ticket office, I said to the guy behind the, behind the counter, I said, um, when's the next train to Liverpool, this is me ticket, he went, got the ticket and went, stamped it and said, get the next one. Now if I'd have gone all stressed, he might have said, this guy's got a bit of an attitude. Mm -hmm. So, it's um, computer, um, 200 pound or whatever. Yeah. So, that, that, that learned me that when things do go wrong, which they do, because like, yeah. What's the famous uh, Murphy's Law? It says 99.9% .9 of things always go wrong, and if you don't prepare, then 
Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. Speaking about Murphy's Law, that brings us to the end here, Rich. I mean, you know, I mean, it's it's fascinating, you know, series of events, you know, it's like Lemony Snicket or something. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I'm just, gonna, I'm just excited to um, check out more of the anecdotes and the stories that you're going to be sharing on the philosophy of winning here mm -hmm. on Condor Online. I mean, we got uh, your first show already in the can, ready to mm -hmm. air this week mm -hmm. and everything. And, you know, and I'm looking forward to, you know, more tales of adventure mm -hmm. and of winning. All right. But uh, I want to thank you for joining me here on the Community Podcast. Thank you. This is Richard Johnson. I'm Chase Johnson Lynch. And our time is out. So I'm just going to say peace.